Politics and Foreign Relations in a Rapidly Changing Nation, 1865 to 1900. Individual Choices, Karl Schurz. Born in what is now Germany, Karl Schurz became involved in politics as a student at the University of Bonn in 1848 when he joined a failed revolution in support of greater democracy. Like other 48ers, he fled to the United States. Immediately drawn to the anti-slavery movement, he soon began campaigning for the new Republican Party, especially among German Americans. Schurz fought in the Union Army, reaching the rank of Major General by the end of the Civil War. He served in the U.S. Senate from Missouri from 1869 to 1875, the first German American in that body, and President Rutherford B. Hayes appointed him Secretary of the Interior, a post he held from 1877 to 1881. Thereafter, as a nationally prominent journalist, he worked for civil service reform and, after 1898, against American acquisition of the Philippines and imperialism more generally. In 1887, Hayes encouraged Schurz to write something to explain his political career because many politicians considered him an enigma and a mystery. Hayes continued, the common explanation is, well, he is a German or he is a free trader. He is a good man, an honest man, a man of extraordinary talents, not a practical man in the political conduct. In what way was Schurz not practical? Hayes specified that it was because Schurz, I'm not sure how to say his last name, Schurz was lacking in the strength of the tie which binds the average American to his party. To break it is almost a crime. Schurz entered American politics at a time when political parties were their strongest, controlling nearly every aspect of political decision making. It was a time when all men were expected to have strong and continuing loyalty to a political party and to vote the party ticket straight, that is, to unquestioningly support their party's candidates. Those who broke with their party drew the contempt of mainstream politicians who called them, quote, political hermaphrodites, eunuchs, and man milliners, men who made women's hats, reflecting the extent to which being a loyal party member was closely tied to a man's gender role. For Schurz, however, loyalty to principles was more important than loyalty to party. During the presidency of U.S. Grant, Schurz broke with the Republican Party and led the liberal Republican movement, which opposed Grant's re-election. He later returned to Republican ranks, but refused to support the Republican presidential candidate in 1884. He then became the nation's best-known independent, dividing his support for candidates on the basis of issues, especially civil service reform and later foreign policy. His principled independence brought him many admirers, but he, even, but he made even more enemies by his scathing criticism of those he considered unprincipled. Scherz's political career came during a time when the nation's economy was changing at a breakneck pace, but when politics seemed to change very little. Americans expected that politics meant party politics and that all meaningful political choices came through their major parties. Yet from 1874 until the 1890s, there were few major innovations in federal policies as the two major parties deadlocked. In foreign relations, too, things changed very little. All that began to change in the 1890s, when political discontent in the West and South erupted into a new party, the People's Party, soon called the Populists. Definitely know the Populists. Politics crackled with new ideas and new alignments, shooting sparks in all directions. The 1896 presidential election was one of the most hard fought in the nation's history. That election brought an end to the long political logjam. Republicans emerged victorious and dominated politics for the next 34 years, and the 1890s ended with a war that ushered in a new role for the United States in world affairs, including the acquisition of new territorial possessions stretching nearly halfway around the world, and they're talking, of course, about the Spanish-American War. Parties, spoils, scandals, and stalemate, 1865 to 1880, concerning the questions, what was the significance of political parties in the late 19th century, and compare the presidencies from Grant through Cleveland, which do you consider successful and why? Political parties were central to politics and government throughout most of the 19th century, but they were organized and behaved very differently from their counterparts today. Any understanding of politics in this period, therefore, must begin with political parties, what they were, what they did, what they stood for, and what choices they offered to voters. Parties, conventions, and patronage. After the 1830s, nominations for political office came from party conventions. Party conventions, by the way, are party meetings to nominate candidates for elective offices and where they also adopt platforms. The process of selecting convention delegates began when neighborhood voters gathered in party caucuses to choose delegates to local conventions. Conventions took place at county, state, and national levels and for congressional districts and state legislative districts. At most conventions, the delegates listened to long-winded speakers uh, glorifying their party and denouncing the opposition. They nominated candidates for elective offices or chose delegates to another convention further up the federal ladder. And they adopted a platform. A platform, by the way, is a written statement of the principles, policies, and promises on which a political party appeals to voters. Party leaders worked to negotiate compromises among major groups within their party on both candidates and platform language. Such deal making sometimes occurred in hotel rooms thick with cigar smoke and cluttered with whiskey bottles, reinforcing the notion of political parties as all male bastions into which no self respecting woman would dare venture. After choosing their candidates, parties launched their campaigns. 
Campaigns focused on party identity. Newspapers were the major source of news and nearly every newspaper identified closely with the political party. The party subsidized sympathetic newspapers and the newspapers delivered both effusive support for their party and scathing attacks on the opposition. Before an election, local party organizers or organizations whipped up enthusiasm among party loyalists and tried to recruit new or undecided voters through parades, barbecues, and rallies capped off by hours of speech making. On election day, each party tried to mobilize all its supporters and make certain that they voted. This produced very high levels of voter participation. More than 80% of eligible voters cast their ballots in 1876. At polling places, party workers distributed lists uh, or tickets of their party's candidates, which voters used as ballots. Voting was not secret until the 1890s. Before then, everybody could see which party's ticket a voter turned in. The voting process discouraged voters from crossing party lines. It's not until we get the Australian ballot talked about a little bit later that we have the actual secret ballot. Once the votes were counted, newly elected presidents or governors or mayors began appointing their supporters to government jobs, which were widely considered appropriate rewards for hard work during a winning campaign. Those appointed to such jobs were also expected to return part of their salaries to the party. This was called the patronage system or the spoils system. Kind of sounds like something that Jackson used to do. After a statement by Senator William Marcy in 1831, who of course was in office, you know, he's, he's talking when Jackson's in office, to the victor belong the spoils. Its defenders were labeled spoilsmen. Since party loyalists inevitably outnumbered available jobs, fierce competition raged over appointments. When James Garfield became president in 1881, he was so overwhelmed with demands for jobs that he exclaimed in disgust, my God, what is there in this place that a man should ever want to get into it? Jobs in highest demand often involved purchasing or government contracts, another form of spoils that are awarded to businessmen who supported the party. This system invited corruption. One post office official, for example, pressured postmasters to buy clocks from one of his political associates. Such opportunities were limited only by the imagination of the spoilsmen. Carl Schurz and other critics of the spoil system argued that by concentrating so much on patronage, politics ignored principles and issues and revolved instead around greed for office. The spoil system had many defenders, however. George W. Plunkett, a longtime participant in New York City politics, explained, you can't keep an organization together without patronage. Men ain't in politics for nothing. Plunkett described the reality. Given the many party workers needed to identify supporters and mobilize voters, politics required rewards. The mixed blessings of urban machine politics. In Plunkett's New York and most big cities, politics meant something very different from what it meant to such reformers as Schurz. Throughout the late 19th century, big city politicians built loyal followings in poor neighborhoods by addressing the residents' needs directly and personally. In return, they wanted political loyalty from the poor who they were helping out. In 1905, a newspaper reporter published a series of conversations with Plunkett that provided insights into the nature of urban politics and its relation to the sort of urban poverty revealed by Jacob Rees, who was discussed in the last chapter. Remember, he's the one who took the photos of the tenements and showed people how awful the conditions were? Born in a poor Irish neighborhood of New York City, Plunkett left school at the age of 11. He entered politics, eventually becoming a district leader of Tammany Hall, a political club that dominated the city's Democratic Party. Between 1868 and 1904, he also served in a number of elected positions in state and city government. Plunkett described to the reporter his formula for keeping the loyalty of the voters in his neighborhood. Go right down among the poor families and help them in the different ways they need help. It's philanthropy, but it's politics too. Mighty good politics. The poor are the most grateful people in the world. And let me tell you, they have more friends in their neighborhoods than the rich have in theirs. If there's a family in my district in, in want, I know it before the charitable societies and me and my men are first on the ground. The consequence is that a poor look, the poor look up to George W. Plunkett as a father. They come to him in trouble and don't forget him on election day. Plunkett typified many big city politicians across the country. Because neighborhood saloons sometimes served as social gathering places for working class men, would-be politicians frequented saloons, in fact, they sometimes owned them, and they tried to build a personal rapport with the voters at the bar. They responded to the needs of the urban poor by providing a bucket of coal on a cold day or a basket of food at Thanksgiving or a job in some city department. In return, they expected the people they assisted to follow their lead in politics. Similar political organizations based among working class and poor voters, usually led by men of poor immigrant parentage, sometimes Republican, but more often Democratic, flourished in many cities during the years 1870 to 1910, and some survived long after that. Where they amassed great power, their rivals denounced the leader as a boss and the organization as a machine. In every city, opponents of the political machine charged corruption. Most bosses were cautious, but some accumulated sizable fortunes, sometimes through gifts or retainers from companies seeking franchises or city contracts, which their critics called bribes, sometimes through advanced knowledge of city planning. Richard Croker, the boss of Tammany in the 1890s, accumulated an immense personal fortune, but he always insisted that he had never taken a dishonest dollar. 
Above all, the boss has centralized political decision making. A machine politician in Boston, for example, insisted there's got to be in every ward somebody that any bloke can come up to, no matter what he's done, to get help. If a pushcart vendor needed a permit to sell tinware, or a railroad president needed permission to build a bridge, or if a saloon keeper wanted to stay open on Sunday in violation of the law, the machine could help them all if they showed the proper gratitude in return. That means voting. Always, the machine cultivated its base of support among poor and working class voters. Republicans and Democrats. Political campaigns featured parades, barbecues, and interminable speeches, but beneath the hoopla, important differences characterized the major parties. Republicans pointed to their defense of the Union during the Civil War and claimed a monopoly on patriotism, arguing that Democrats, especially Southern Democrats, had proven themselves disloyal. Every man that shot a Union soldier, one Republican orator proclaimed, was a Democrat. Such rhetoric was often called waving the bloody shirt, like pointing out uh, the Civil War and trying to remind people of the Civil War. That's waving the bloody shirt. Republicans in Congress voted generous pensions to disabled Union Army veterans and the widows and orphans of those who died, and Republican leaders cultivated the Grand Army of the Republic, the GAR, the Organization of Union Veterans, attending their meetings and urging them to vote as you shot. Presidential candidates were usually Union veterans, as were many state and local officials throughout the North. Republicans proudly claimed responsibility for prosperity, insisting that post-war economic growth resulted from their policies, especially the protective tariff. Boasting that they were the party of decency and morality, they portrayed as typical Democrats the old slave owner and slave driver, the saloon keeper, the ballot box stuffer, the Ku Klux Klan member, the criminal class of the great cities, the men who cannot read or write. Whereas Republicans defined themselves in terms of what their party did and who they were, Democrats typically focused on what they opposed. Most leading Democrats stood against the protective tariff and land grants, equating government activism with privileges for a favored few. The protective tariff they charged protected manufacturers from international competition at the expense of consumers who paid higher prices. The public domain, they argued, should provide farms for citizens, not subsidies for railroad corporations. In general, Democrats favored a strictly limited role for the government in the economy. Kind of sounds like strict versus loose constructionism from the 1790s, if you ask me. Just as the Democrats opposed governmental interference in the economy, so too did they oppose governmental interference in social relations and behavior. In the North, especially in the Irish and German communities, they condemned prohibition, which they called a violation of personal liberty. In the South, Democrats stood for white supremacy and rejected federal enforcement of equal rights for African Americans, which they denounced as a violation of states' rights. Most voters developed strong loyalties to one party or the other, often based on ethnicity, race, or religion. Nearly all Catholics and many Irish, German, and other immigrants supported the, Democrat, the, bleh, the Democrats. Most Southern whites supported the Democrats as the party of white supremacy. The Democrats' opposition to the protective tariff attracted entrepreneurs with interests in international commerce. The Democrats, all in all, comprised a diverse coalition holding together primarily because of their various components opposed government action on social or economic matters. Outside the South, most old stock Protestants voted Republican, as did most Scandinavian and British immigrants. Nearly all African Americans supported the Republicans as the party of emancipation, as did most veterans of the abolition movement. So many Union voters supported the Republicans that somebody suggested GAR stood for generally all Republicans. Republicans usually carried New England, Pennsylvania, and much of the Midwest. Republicans comprised the more coherent political organization, united around policies that involved action by the federal government to foster economic growth and to protect Blacks' rights. The protective tariff and the use of public domain to encourage economic development both involved positive governmental action. During Reconstruction, the dominant Republicans had changed very, the very nature of the federal government, redefining citizenship and relations between the federal government and the states. I think they're talking about the amendments right there. As one leading Republican put it, the Republican Party does things the Democratic Party criticizes. Neither party, however, proposed to regulate, restrict, or to tax the new industrial corporations. So that's something they have in common. Grant's troubled presidency. Despite success as a general, Ulysses S. Grant seemed unprepared when he won the presidency in 1868. During his two terms, he usually deferred to Congress for domestic policymaking. Too often, he appointed friends or acquaintances to posts for which they possessed few qualifications, and too often, he believed their denials of wrongdoing. He failed to form a competent cabinet, and he faced constant turnover among his advisors. He did choose a highly capable Secretary of State, Hamilton Fish, and eventually found in Benjamin Bristow a Secretary of the Treasury who vigorously combated corruption. Congress supplied its full share of scandal. Visiting Washington in 1869, Henry Adams was surprised to hear a cabinet member bellow, you can't use tact with a congressman. A congressman is a hog. You must take a stick and hit him on the snout. Too many members of Congress behaved in ways that confirmed such cynical views. In 1864, the chief shareholders in the Union Pacific Railroad set up the Credit Mobilier as a construction company, and then they gave it a generous contract 
thereby paying themselves handsomely because they're the ones who own it, using stockholder funds to build their own railroad. To prevent congressional scrutiny, they sold shares at cut rate prices to key congressmen, so they're bribing them to look the other way here. Revelation of these arrangements in 1872-3 scandalized the nation. No sooner did that Fuhrer pass than Congress voted itself a 50% pay raise, and they made the increase two years retroactive. Only after widespread public protest did Congress repeal its salary grab. Public disgrace was not limited to the federal government or to Republicans. In New York City, the Tweed Ring scandal involved city and state officials accused of using bribery, kickbacks, and padded accounts to steal money from New York City and the state. At the center was William Marcy Tweed, also known as Boss Tweed, whose name became synonymous with urban political corruption. Definitely no Boss Tweed, folks. Listen carefully here. Tweed entered New York City politics in the 1850s and became the head of Tammany Hall, that political machine, in 1863. Labeled Boss Tweed by opponents, he and his associates built public support by spending tax funds on charities and giving to the poor from their own pockets. Pockets filled, of course, with ill-gotten gains. Under Tweed's direction, city government launched major construction projects, public buildings, streets, parks, and sewers. Between 1868 and 1871, the Tweed Ring may have plundered $200 million from the city, mostly by giving bloated construction contracts to businesses that returned a kickback to the ring. Basically, they would, as they're you know, in charge of the government here, they would make sure that a certain business got a contract and the contract would pay a lot more money than the work was worth. And then as a thank you, the business would give that politician some money in return, like some money from the contract. That's a kickback. Let's see. In 1871, evidence of corruption led to Tweed's indictment and ultimately his conviction and imprisonment. Grant Dilley easily won re-election in 1872, but the midterm elections of 1874 were a different story. The congressional scandals alienated some voters. Moreover, the depression that began in 1873 undercut Republicans' as claims to have produced prosperity. Throughout the South, political terrorism suppressed the Republican vote. As a result, Democrats took control of the House of Representatives. For 20 years, from 1874 until 1894, Democrats usually kept their majority in the House of Representatives. Although Republicans usually won the presidency, Democratic control of the House made it difficult or impossible for the Republicans to enact major legislation. More scandals were to come. In 1875, Treasury Secretary Brister revealed that a whiskey ring of federal officials and distillers centered in St. Louis had defrauded the government of millions of dollars. The 230 men indicted included several of Grant's appointees and even his private secretary. The next year, William Belknap, Grant's Secretary of War, resigned shortly before he was impeached for accepting bribes. The politics of stalemate, 1876 to 1889. From the mid 1870s to the 1880s, as the nation's economy and social patterns changed with astonishing speed, American politics seemed frozen in place. From the end of the Civil War to the mid 1870s, politics had revolved largely around issues of war and reconstruction. By the late 1870s, other issues became central, notably the economy and political corruption. After the mid-1870s, however, voters divided almost evenly between the two major political parties, beginning a long political stalemate during which neither party could enact its proposals. Basically, neither party is that much stronger than the other. Republican Rutherford B. Hayes became president after the closely contested election of 1876. His personal integrity and principled stand on issues helped to restore his party's reputation after the embarrassments of the Grant administration. However, Democrats held the majority in the House of Representatives. Moreover, Roscoe Conkling, a flamboyant senator and leader of New York's powerful and patronage-hungry Republican organization, scathingly attacked Hayes after Hayes refused Conkling's patronage demands. Hayes even estranged reformers by not seeking reform of the spoils system. He did not seek re-election in 1880. Nobody's happy with him. In 1880, the Republican nominating convention deadlocked between supporters of James G. Blaine of Maine, a spellbinding orator who attracted loyal supporters and bitter enemies, and Conkling and his followers who called themselves stalwarts and wanted to nominate former President Grant. Eventually, the convention compromised, choosing James A. Garfield, a congressman from Ohio. Born in a log cabin, Garfield had grown up in poverty. A minister, college president, and lawyer before the Civil War, he became the Union's youngest major general. For vice president, the delegates nominated Conkling's chief lieutenant, Chester A. Arthur. Garfield won the popular vote by half a percentage point, but he won a secure electoral majority. Majority. He brought to the presidency a solid understanding of Congress and a studious approach to issues. He appointed Blaine as Secretary of State, the most prestigious cabinet position, but he also tried to cooperate with the stalwarts. When Conkling arrogantly demanded his supporters be appointed to key positions, Garfield outmaneuvered him. Humiliated, Conkling resigned from the Senate and Garfield scored a victory for a stronger presidency. 
On July 2nd, 1881, four months after taking office, Garfield was shot while walking through a Washington Railroad station. His assassin, Charles Gateau, a mentally unstable religious fanatic and a disappointed office seeker, claimed that he had acted to save the Republican Party. Two months later, Garfield died owing to an incompetent medical care. Chester A. Arthur now became president. Probably best known as a member of the Conkling organization and a dapper dresser, Arthur soon showed, as a former associate said, that he isn't Chet Arthur anymore, he's the president. In 1882, doctors diagnosed him with Bright's disease, a kidney condition that produced fatigue, depression, and eventually death. Arthur kept the news secret from all but his family and closest friends. Despite political liabilities and his own physical limitations, Arthur proved more capable than anybody might have predicted. In 1884, Blaine, charming and quick-witted, finally secured the Republican nomination. Democrats chose Grover Cleveland, governor of New York, whose reputation for integrity and political courage had, become, had come partly from attacking Tammany Hall. Seeking to tarnish that reputation, Republicans chanted, Ma, Ma, where's my pa? to trumpet that Cleveland had fathered a child outside of marriage. Oh, the scandal. The election hinged on New York State, where many Irish voters, a large component in Tammany, seemed attracted to Blaine. A few days before the election, however, Blaine was present when a preacher in New York City called Democrats the party of rum, Romanism, aka Catholicism, and rebellion. When Blaine was slow to respond to this insult to Irish Catholics, Cleveland won New York by a tiny margin, and New York's electoral votes gave him victory. It was that close. Cleveland enjoyed support from many who opposed the spoil system, and he insisted on demonstrated ability in those he appointed office. Staunchly committed to minimum government and minimal government and cutting federal spending, Cleveland vetoed 414 bills, most granting pensions to individual union veterans, twice as many vetoes as all the previous presidents combined. Cleveland deferred to Congress regarding policymaking and he approved several important measures produced by the Democratic House and Republican Senate, including the Dawes Severalty Act, discussed last chapter, and the Interstate Commerce Act. The Interstate Commerce Act grew out of political pressure from farmers and small businesses. In the early 1870s, several Midwestern states passed Granger laws regulating railroad freight rates discussed later in the chapter. In 1886, however, the Supreme Court limited states' power to regulate railroad rates. In response to the growing protests over railroad rate discrimination, Congress passed the Interstate Commerce Act in 1887. This new law created the ICC, or the Interstate Commerce Commission, which was the first federal regulatory commission. Definitely know the ICC folks. Although the new law prohibited pools and rebates and required that rates be reasonable and just, the ICC had little real regulatory power until the Hepburn Act strengthened it in 1906, and that's going to be when Theodore Roosevelt is president. Cleveland considered the nation's greatest problem to be the federal budget surplus. After the Civil War, the tariff usually generated more income than the country needed. Worried that the surplus encouraged wasteful spending and that tariffs reduced competition and led to monopolies, Cleveland demanded in 1887 that Congress cut tariff rates. His action divided Democrats, but Cleveland provided little leadership. The House and Senate deadlocked, each writing a quite different version of tariff reform. Congress then adjourned without taking action. Cleveland's calls for tariff reform came to nothing. In the 1888 presidential election, Democrats renominated Cleveland, but he avoided the tariff issue and did little campaigning. Republicans nominated Benjamin Harrison, a senator from Indiana and a former Civil War general. Thoughtful and cautious, Harrison impressed many as cool and distant. Republicans campaigned vigorously in defense of the protective tariff, raising unprecedented amounts of campaign money from business leaders and issuing record amounts of campaign materials. Harrison received fewer votes than Cleveland, but he won the Electoral College. As important for the Republicans as their narrow presidential victory, uh, however, were the majorities they secured in the House and the Senate. Harrison and the 51st Congress. With Harrison in the White House and Republican majorities in Congress, the Republicans set out to do a lot and to do it quickly. When the 51st session of Congress opened late in 1889, Harrison worked more closely with congressional leaders of his own party than any other president in recent memory. Democrats in the House of Representatives tried to delay, but Speaker Thomas B. Reed, an enormous man renowned for his wit, imposed new rules designed to speed up House business. Republicans first turned to tariff revision to cut the troublesome federal surplus without reducing production. Led by William McKinley of Ohio, the House approved a bill that moved some items to the free list, notably sugar, a major source of tariff revenue, but raised tariffs on other items. Called the McKinley Tariff, the bill was sent to the Senate. The House also approved a federal elections bill sponsored by Representative Henry Cabot Lodge of Massachusetts. The bill proposed federal supervision over congressional elections in the South to protect the voting rights of African Americans. Democrats called it a, quote, force bill, evoking memories of Reconstruction. After passing the House, the measure went to the Senate, where approval by the Republican majority seemed likely. 
Harrison wanted the two bills passed as a party package, but Republicans feared that a Democratic filibuster against the elections bill would prevent passage of both measures. A filibuster, by the way, is a speech by a bill's opponents to delay legislative action. Usually it applies to extended speeches in the US Senate, which has no time limit on speeches and where a minority may therefore talk a bill to death by holding up all other business. Despite protests by Lodge and others, a compromise emerged. Republicans would table the elections bill and Democrats would not delay the tariff bill. Thus, Republicans sacrificed African-Americans as voting rights in order to gain the revised tariff. Harrison signed the McKinley Tariff on October 1st, 1890, and the revised tariff soon produced the intended result. It reduced the surplus by cutting tariff income. The Senate, meanwhile, had been laboring over two measures named for Senator John Sherman of Ohio, the Sherman Silver Purchase Act, discussed shortly, and the Sherman Antitrust Act. The Sherman Antitrust Act, drafted by several Republican senators working with Harrison, was Republicans' response to public concern about monopolies. Approved overwhelmingly, the law declared that, quote, every contract combination in the form of trust or otherwise, or conspiracy in restraint of trade or commerce among the several states or with foreign nations, is hereby declared to be illegal. The law made the United States the first industrial nation to attempt to prevent monopolies, but it proved very difficult to interpret and it had little initial effect. It's going to be a while before we see the Sherman Antitrust Act really put to use as it was intended. In 10 months, the Republicans passed what one Democrat called a raging sea of ravenous legislation. In addition to the McKinley Tariff, the Sherman Antitrust Act, and the Silver Purchase Act, the record number of new laws included appropriations to create a modern Navy, a major increase in pension eligibility for disabled Union veterans and their dependents, statehood for North and South Dakota, Montana, Washington, Idaho, and Wyoming, and creation of territorial government in Oklahoma. Republicans hoped they had finally broken the political logjam that had clogged up politics ever since 1875. Challenges to politics as usual. Considering the questions, what were the major goals of the various reform groups and why were some reformers more successful than others? Although political change seemed to move at a glacial pace in the Gilded Age, several groups challenged mainstream politics and sought new policies and new political procedures. Given the large number of Americans engaged in agriculture, it is not surprising that farmers were prominent in several significant movements. Grangers, Greenbackers, and Silverites. Crop prices fell steadily after the Civil War as production of wheat, corn, and cotton grew much faster than the population. Some farmers, however, denied that prices were falling because of overproduction, pointing to the hungry and ragged residents of urban slums. Farmers condemned the monopolistic practices of commodity markets in Chicago and New York that determined crop prices. Commodity markets, by the way, are financial markets in which brokers buy and sell agricultural products in large quantities, thus determining the prices paid to farmers for their harvests. When they brought their crops to market, farmers accepted the price that was offered because they needed cash to pay their debts and they could not store their crops for later sale at a higher price. But they knew that the bushel of corn they sold for 10 or 20 cents in October brought three or four times that amount to New York in December. Many farmers borrowed heavily to establish new farms after the Civil War. Falling prices magnified their indebtedness. Because crop prices sank lower and lower, farmers raised more and more just to pay their mortgages and buy necessities. Given the relation between supply and demand, the more they raised, the lower prices fell. As they ran faster and faster just to stay in the same place, many found they could not keep up. The railroads, too, seemed to be greedy monopolies that charged as much as possible to deliver supplies to rural America and to carry farm crops to market. Shipping freight in the west or the south sometimes cost four times as much in the east, for as much as in the east. Farmers also protested uh, that railroads dominated politics in many western and southern states and distributed free passes to politicians in return for favorable treatment. Soon, organizations began to address the scourges of falling prices and high railroad freight rates. The first, officially called the Patrons of Husbandry, but usually known as the Grange, definitely know the Grange folks, was formed in 1867 and it extended full participation to women as well as men. Initially intended as a social outlet for farm families and a way to educate them in new farming methods, the Grange grew rapidly, especially in the Midwest and Central South. In the 1870s, many local granges set up cooperative stores or consumers as cooperatives where members could do their shopping and divide any profits among themselves. Some formed producers cooperatives in which farmers agreed to hold their crops back from market and jointly negotiate over prices. Two state granges began manufacturing farm machinery and grangers planned for cooperative factories producing everything from wagons to sewing machines. Some grangers formed mutual insurance companies too and a few experimented with cooperative banks. The Grange defined itself as nonpartisan, meaning that they don't take political sides. However, as Grange membership boomed in the 1870s, Midwestern and Western Grangers moved toward political action. New political parties emerged in 11 states, usually called Granger parties. 
they demanded state legislation to prohibit railroad rate discrimination. Other groups, especially merchants, also sought such laws, but the resulting state laws, most dating to 1872 to 4, were usually called Granger laws. When the constitutionality of such regulation was challenged, the Supreme Court ruled in Munn v. Illinois that business with a public interest, including warehouses and railroads, must submit to be controlled by the public for the common good. The Grange reached its zenith in the mid-1870s. Hastily organized cooperatives soon encountered financial problems that were compounded by the National Depression. Remember the Panic of 1873, folks? As cooperatives collapsed, they often pulled down Grange organizations. Political activity brought some successes, but it also generated bitter internal disputes. The organization lost many members, and surviving granges generally avoided both cooperatives and politics. With the decline of the grange, some farmers looked to monetary policy for relief. Monetary policy, by the way, is defined as now, well, now, the regulation of the money supply and interest rates by the Federal Reserve. Before 1913, federal monetary policy was largely limited to defining the medium of the currency, so whether currency would be in gold, silver, or paper, and the relations between the types of currency. After the Civil War, most prices fell, a situation called deflation, the opposite of inflation, because of increased production, more efficient techniques in agriculture and manufacturing, and the failure of the money supply to grow as rapidly as the economy. Deflation injures debtors because it means the money uh, that the money that they have to use to pay off a loan has greater purchasing power and is harder to come by than the money of the original loan. The Greenback Party argued that printing more greenbacks, the paper money issued during the Civil War, would increase the supply of money and thereby stabilize prices. They found a receptive audience among farmers in debt. In the congressional elections of 1878, the Greenback Party received nearly a million votes and it elected 14 congressmen. In the 1880 presidential election, Greenbackers tried to attract urban workers by supporting the eight-hour workday, legislation to protect workers, and the abolition of child labor. They also called for regulation of transportation and communication, a graduated income tax, which they considered the fairest form of taxation, and woman suffrage. For president, they nominated James B. Weaver of Iowa, a Greenback congressman and former Union Army general. He got only 3.3% of the vote, but at least he tried. The prevalent currency deflation also motivated those who wanted the government to resume issuing silver dollars. In 1873, Congress dropped the silver dollar from the list of approved coins, following the lead of Britain, Germany, and other European nations, which had specified that only gold was to serve as money. Some Americans believed that adhering to the gold standard was essential if American businesses were to compete effectively in international markets for capital and for goods. Given major silver discoveries in the West, resuming silver coinage seemed a way to counteract deflation without resorting to greenbacks. Silver coinage quickly found support not just among farmers, but also among silver mining interests. Members of this farm, farming mining coalition were soon called Silverites. In 1878, over Hayes's veto, Congress passed the Bland-Allison Act, authorizing a limited amount of silver dollars. The act failed to counteract deflation, and it satisfied neither Silverites nor gold supporters. The Sherman Silver Purchase Act of 1890 increased the amount of silver to be coined, but both silverites and advocates of the gold standard still found it unsatisfactory. Toward a more perfect union, the meaning of the Commerce Clause. The Sherman Antitrust Act reads, in part, every person who shall monopolize or attempt to monopolize or combine or conspire with any other person or persons to mobilize any part of the trade or commerce among the several states shall be deemed guilty of a felony. The law was widely understood at the time as outlawing such monopolies as standard oil. By referring to commerce among the several states, the law was citing the constitutional authority of Congress to regulate commerce among the several states, and that is from Article 1, Section 8. The American Sugar Refining Company challenged the law. In U.S. v. E.C. Knight, 1895, the Supreme Court specified that manufacturing, such as sugar refining, took place entirely within one state and was therefore immune from federal law. This decision significantly limited federal regulatory, regulatory authority until 1905, when the Supreme Court defined manufacturing as part of a stream of commerce that crossed state lines and was therefore subject to federal regulation. The stream of commerce doctrine underlies most federal economic regulations of sub subsequent years, but it has recently been questioned by the Supreme Court. Reforming the spoil system. A very different set of reformers challenged the spoil system. Called mugwumps by their contemporaries and centered in Boston and New York, most were Republicans of high social status. Like Carl Schurz, the mugwumps blamed many of the defects in politics on the spoils system, and they argued that eliminating patronage would drive out the opportunists. So basically, try to make getting a job hinge on maybe your ability, what you can do, rather than who you know or who might think that they owe you a job. 
Instead, they advocated a merit-based system for a point of governmental position based on the ability to pass a comprehensive examination. As they did with others who broke with their party, party politicians sometimes questioned the Mugwumps' manhood. The assassination of President Garfield by a disappointed office seeker spurred efforts to reform the patronage system. Sponsored by Senator George Pendleton, an Ohio Democrat, the Pendleton Act of 1883 created a merit system for filling federal positions. This new law, the Pendleton Civil Service Act, designated certain federal positions, about 15% of the total, as classified and required classified civil service positions to be filled only through competitive examinations. The law authorized the president to add positions to the classified list. Within 20 years, the law applied to 44% of federal employees. State and local governments eventually adopted merit-based systems as well. Challenging the male bastion, women suffrage. In the masculine political world of the Gilded Age, men were expected to display strong loyalty to a political party, but men considered women who could not vote to stand outside of politics. The concepts of domesticity and separate spheres dictated that women avoid politics, especially party politics. Some women nonetheless involved themselves in reform efforts, and a few took part in party activities, and some pushed for full political participation, including the right to vote. The struggle for women's suffrage was, uh, long -standing, was of long standing. In 1848, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and four other women had organized the world's first women's rights convention held at Seneca Falls, New York. Their Declaration of Principles announced in part, it is the duty of the women of this country to secure for themselves their sacred right to the elector franchise. Stanton and Susan B. Anthony became the most prominent advocates for women's rights, especially voting rights, for the next 50 years. They secured changes in some laws that discriminated against women, and women came increasingly to participate in public affairs, in movements to abolish slavery, to mobilize support for the union, improve educational opportunities, end child labor, and more. In 1866, Stanton and Anthony unsuccessfully opposed inclusion of the word male in the 14th Amendment. In 1869, they formed the National Women's Suffrage Association, the NWSA, open only to women and sought an amendment to the federal constitution as the only sure route to women's suffrage. NWSA built alliances with other reform and radical organizations and worked to improve women's status, promoting women's trade unions and lobbying for easier divorce laws and access to birth control information. In contrast, the American Woman Suffrage Association, the AWSA, organized by Lucy Stone and other suffrage advocates, also in 1869, the same year as the NWSA, they concentrated strictly on winning the vote and they avoided all other issues. The two merged in 1890 to become the National American Women's Suffrage Association, the NAWSA. The first victories for suffrage came in the West. In 1869, in Wyoming Territory, the territorial legislature extended the franchise to women. Wyoming women had forged a well-organized suffrage movement, and they, they had persuaded male legislators to support their cause. Some legislators also hoped that women's suffrage would attract women to Wyoming, where men outnumbered women by seven to two. Thereafter, women in Wyoming Territory voted, served on juries, and they even held elective office. In 1889, when Wyoming asked for statehood, some congressmen balked at admitting a state with woman suffrage. Wyoming legislators, however, bluntly stated, we will remain out of the union a hundred years rather than come in without the women. Congress finally voted to approve Wyoming statehood with woman suffrage in 1890. Utah Territory adopted woman suffrage in 1870. There, Mormon men formed the majority of voters and Mormon women far outnumbered non-Mormon women. Mormons thereby strengthened their voting majority, and they may have hoped to silence those who claimed that polygamy degraded women. However, Congress outlawed polygamy in 1887 and simultaneously disenfranchised Utah women. Not until Utah became a state in 1896 did its women regain the vote. In 1893, Colorado voters, all male, approved women's suffrage, making Colorado the first state to adopt women's suffrage through a popular vote. In addition to a well-organized campaign by Colorado women, their cause was assisted by support from the new populist party discussed in the next section. In Idaho, where both Mormon and populist influences were strong, male voters approved women's suffrage in 1896. These western states and territories were among the first places in the world to extend equal voting rights to women. Several states also began to extend limited voting rights to women, especially for school-related elections, reflecting perhaps the widespread assumption that women's gender roles included child rearing. By 1890, women could vote in school elections in 19 states. Structural change and policy change. Grangers, Greenbackers, local label parties, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the WCTU, Mugwumps, and advocates of women's suffrage all challenged basic features of the party-bound political system of the Gilded Age. They and other groups advocated changes that the major parties ignored. Abolition of the spoil system, women's suffrage, prohibition, the secret ballot, regulation of business, an end to child labor, changes in monetary policy, and more. 
Most of these groups called themselves reformers, meaning they wanted to change the form of politics, either by structural change or policy change. Structural reform modifies the structure or produces or procedures, excuse me, of the political system. Advocates of women's suffrage, for example, wanted to change eligibility for voting, and the Mugwumps sought a new system for filling appointive offices. Policy issues, in contrast, have to do with the way the government uses its power. The debate over federal economic policy in the Gilded Age provides an array of contrasting positions. Most Democrats believe that federal interference in the economy created a privileged class. Republicans used land grants and the protective tariff to encourage economic growth. Grangers wanted the government to regulate railroads. Greenbackers wanted monetary policy to benefit debtors, or as they would have put it, to stop benefiting lenders. Groups who sought change may find that they have little in common with other groups or may seek to cooperate with them. Francis Willard of the WCTU embraced a wide range of reforms. One key distinction between the NWSA, the National Women's Suffrage Association, and the AWSA, the American Women's Suffrage Association, was that the NWSA welcomed political alliances with groups who supported suffrage for all citizens. The AWSA feared such alliances might lose more support than they gained, and they focused narrowly on suffrage. The tiny prohibition party wanted government to eliminate alcohol, but they also favored women's suffrage in part because they assumed that women voters would oppose alcohol. Thus, they promoted a structural reform, women's suffrage, in part to accomplish a policy reform, prohibition of alcohol. Advocates of women's suffrage also argued that enfranchising women would lead to new approaches to politics and new policies. One important structural change received widespread support. The Australian ballot, printed and distributed by the government, not by political parties, listing all candidates of all parties and marked in a private voting booth so it's secret, was first adopted by Massachusetts in 1888. The idea quickly spread to all states and it carried important implications for political parties. Now voters could easily cross party lines. No longer could party activists see which party's ballot a voter dropped into the ballot box. The switch to the Australian ballot and the Pendleton Act marked significant early efforts to limit parties' power and influence. There's an excerpt on 482 also um, in the wider world all about women's suffrage all around the world. I would recommend that you take a look at that because it can be quite eye-opening. Political upheaval in the 1890s, considering the questions, which groups and issues led to the formation of the Populist Party, and what were the issues in the 1896 presidential election, and what were the short-term and long-term results? In 1890 to 1891, farmers who had felt hard pressed by debts, low prices for their crops, and the monopoly power of the railroads formed the People's Party or Populists, and they won elections in several Western and Southern states. The Depression that began in 1893 set the stage for more political change, culminating in the 1896 presidential election, which made the Republicans the majority party for a generation. The People's Party, Revolt of the West and South. Populism grew out of the economic problems of farmers, especially falling prices for crops, the economic power of the railroads, and currency issues. The Grange, the Greenback Party, and the Silver Movement in the late 1870s had expressed farmers' as grievances, but those movements faded during the relatively prosperous 1880s. By 1890, however, falling crop prices and widespread indebtedness brought renewed concern among farmers. In the 1880s, three new organizations emerged, all called Farmers' Alliances. One was centered in the, in the North Central States. Another, the Southern Alliance, began in Texas in the late 1870s and spread east toward across the South. The Southern Alliance limited its membership to whites, but a third group, the Colored Farmers' Alliance, recruited Black farmers. Like the Grange and Knights of Labor, the alliances defined themselves as organizations of the producing classes, and they looked to cooperatives as partial solutions to their problems. Alliance stores are the most common. The Texas Alliance experimented with cooperative cotton selling, and some Midwestern local alliances tried cooperative grain storage and selling. Local alliance meetings featured social and educational activities. By the late 1880s, a host of weekly newspapers across the South and West presented alliance views. One Kansas woman, hey Kansas, described the result. People commenced to think who had never thought before and people talked to had seldom, seldom spoken. Thoughts and theories sprouted like weeds after a May shower. The alliances defined themselves as nonpartisan and they expected members to work within the major parties. This was especially important in the South, where any white person who challenged the Democratic Party risked being condemned as a traitor to both race and region. Many Midwestern Alliance leaders, however, had been in the Granger or Greenback parties. During the winter of 1889 to 90, corn prices had fallen so low that some farmers found it cheaper to burn their corn than to sell it and buy fuel. More and more Alliance members talked of political action. Through the hot summer of 1890, Alliance members in Kansas, Nebraska, the Dakotas, Minnesota, and surrounding states formed new political parties to contest state and local elections. One explained that the political battle they waged was between the insatiable greed of organized wealth and the rights of the great plain people. 
women took a prominent part in populist campaigning, especially in Kansas and Nebraska. Populists embraced three elements in their campaigns. First, anti-monopolism, government action on behalf of farmers and workers, and increased popular control of government. Their anti-monopolism drew on their unhappy experiences with railroads, grain buyers, and manufacturing companies. It also derived from a long American tradition of opposition to concentrated economic power. Populists quoted Thomas Jefferson on the importance of equal rights for all, and they compared themselves to Andrew Jackson in his fight against the Bank of the United States. The second element in populist campaigns was to argue for governmental action to protect farmers and workers from the and workers the dangers of monopoly. We believe the time has come, populists proclaimed in 1892, when the railroad companies will either own the people or the people must own the railroads. Populists advocated for federal ownership of the railroads and the telegraph and telephone systems and government alternatives to private banks. Currency expansion through greenbacks, silver, or both figured prominently in the populists' platform along with a graduated income tax. Through such measures, they hoped, in the words of their 1892 platform, that oppression, injustice, and poverty shall eventually cease in the land. They sought support among urban and industrial workers by calling for the eight-hour workday and opposing companies' use of private armies in labor disputes. I think that might be a reference to what happened um, at Homestead with Carnegie. The third element in populist campaigns was structural reform to make government more responsive to the people, including expansion of the merit system for government employees like the Pendleton Act, election of U.S. senators by voters instead of state legislatures, that would eventually be an amendment, a one-term limit for the president, and the secret ballot or the Australian ballot. Many favored women's suffrage. In the South, populists posed a, posed a serious challenge to the prevailing patterns of politics by seeking to forge a political alliance of the disadvantaged of both races. Populists usually opposed disenfranchisement of Black voters, meaning that populists were usually in favor of Black people being able to vote, especially in the South. Thus, populists advocated government regulation or ownership of the corporate behemoths that had evolved in their lifetimes. They deeply distrusted the old parties and they wanted to increase the power of the individual voter. The elections of 1890 and 1892. Despite Republicans' hopes for breaking the political logjam during the 51st Congress, they immediately found themselves on the defensive. Issues in the 1890 election for the House of Representatives and state and local offices varied by region. In the West, the populists lambasted both major parties for ignoring the needs of the people. In the South, Democrats held up Lodge's force bill as a warning of the potential dangers if Southern whites should bolt the party of white supremacy, so if they should leave the party of white supremacy. There, the Southern Alliance worked within the Democratic Party to secure candidates committed to the farmers' cause. In the Northeast, Democrats attacked the McKinley Tariff for producing higher prices for consumers. In the Rocky Mountain region, nearly all candidates pledged their support for unlimited silver coinage. The populists scored several victories, making them the most successful new party since the Republicans in the 1850s. Kansas Republican Senator John J. Ingalls had dismissed populists as a sort of turnip crusade, but populists won control of the Kansas legislature and they elected a populist to replace Ingalls in the Senate. Elsewhere, populists elected state legislatures, members of Congress, and one other U.S. Senator. Across the South, the Alliance claimed that successful candidates owed their victories to Alliance voters. Everywhere Republicans suffered defeat, losing nearly half their seats in the House of Representatives and many state and local offices. Such losses bred dissension within the party and President Harrison could not maintain party unity. For the 1892 presidential election, the Republicans renominated Harrison, though he aroused little enthusiasm among many party leaders. The Democrats again chose Grover Cleveland. Southern Alliance activists joined Western populists to form a National People's Party, and they nominated James Weaver, the Greenback presidential candidate in 1880. Democrats and populists scored the most impressive victories. Cleveland became the only president in American history to win two non-consecutive terms. Democrats kept control of the House of Representatives and won a majority in the Senate. Populists showed strength across the West and the South. The Democrats now found themselves where the Republicans had stood four years before, in control of the presidency and Congress. Failure of the Divided Democrats When Congress met in 1893, Democrats faced several controversial issues, especially silver coinage and tariff reform. A major depression had begun earlier that year, and rising, rising unemployment also demanded attention. President Cleveland, holding to Democrats' traditional commitment to minimal government and laissez-faire, opposed federal assistance to those in need. And amidst national economic crisis, Cleveland suffered a personal crisis. Doctors had detected cancer in his mouth. Fearing this news might lead to further financial panic, the president kept his surgery and his recuperation secret. 
Many business leaders argued that the Sherman Silver Purchase Act of 1890 had caused a gold drain that set off the depression, but many Western and Southern Democrats found it preferable to no silver coinage at all. Convinced that silver coinage had contributed to the economic collapse, Cleveland asked Congress to repeal the act. In the House of Representatives, most Republicans voted for repeal, but more than a third of Democrats opposed it. In the Senate, Republicans supported Cleveland by two to one, but Democrats divided almost evenly. Cleveland won, but divided his own party, pitting the Northeast against the West and much of the South. After the Democrats' harsh condemnation of the McKinley Tariff during the 1892 elections, they now had to do better. The tariff bill produced by the House reduced duties tried to balance sectional interests and created an income tax to replace lost federal revenue. Senate Democrats, however, loaded on many amendments. Cleveland characterized the result as party dishonor and he refused to sign it. It became law without his signature in 1894. The Supreme Court soon declared the income tax unconstitutional, though. By 1894, many Americans were becoming anxious over social disorders. Early that year, Jacob S. Coxey, an Ohio populist, announced a march on Washington to promote public work programs to provide jobs for the unemployed. The response electrified the nation. By April, 6,000 people were camped outside of Washington. Soon after, the Pullman strike shut down many of the nation's railroads until Cleveland deployed U.S. troops and marshals against the strikers. Voters recorded their disgust with the disorganized Democrats in the 1894 election. Democrats lost everywhere but in the Deep South, giving up 113 seats in the House of Representatives. Wow, that is a huge loss. Populists made a few gains, and they suffered some losses. Republicans, though, made, uh, made out like bandits. Republicans added 117 House seats, their biggest gain ever, and they looked forward eagerly to the 1896 presidential election. The 1896 election and the new Republican majority. Republicans confidently anticipated victory in the 1896 presidential election. They nominated William McKinley, a union veteran who had risen to the rank of major. McKinley had served 14 years in Congress where he had specialized in the tariff and two terms as governor of Ohio. Calm and competent, McKinley billed himself as the advanced agent of prosperity. The Republican platform supported the gold standard and opposed silver, but McKinley preferred to focus on the tariff. When the convention voted against silver, several Western Republicans walked out of the convention and out of the party. When the Democratic Convention met, silver rights held the majority but were split among several candidates. Then the platform committee chose William Jennings Bryan of Nebraska to speak in a debate on silver. Blessed with a commanding voice, Bryan had won election to the House of Representatives in 1890 and 1892, and he had gained national attention for his eloquent defense of silver. His speech was masterful, defining the issue as a conflict between the producing masses and the idle holders of idle capital. He argued that the first priority of federal policy should be to make the masses prosperous rather than to benefit the rich in the hope that their prosperity will leak through on those below. His closing uh, his closing rang defiant. We will answer the demand for a gold standard by saying to them, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. That speech provoked an enthusiastic demonstration for silver and for Brian. Only 36 years old, Brian soon won the presidential nomination. You've definitely got to understand the cross of gold speech, William Jennings Bryan, and he's going to be around for a while, folks. He is a big figure on the national political stage. The populists and defecting Republicans, quickly dubbed silver Republicans, held nominating conventions next amid frustration that the Democrats had stolen their thunder. Brian favored silver, the income tax, and other reforms the populists favored, and he had worked closely with the populists. Populists gave him their nomination too, and silver Republicans did the same, so he's basically supported by multiple parties for the presidency. Subsequently, a group of Cleveland supporters nominated a gold Democratic candidate. Brian and McKinley fought all-out campaigns but used sharply contrasting tactics. Brian, vigorous and young, used his speaking voice as his greatest campaign tool. He spoke directly to the voters in four grueling train journeys through 26 states and more than 250 cities. Speaking to perhaps 5 million people in all, he stressed over and over that silver was the most important issue and that other reforms would follow once it was settled. Large crowds of excited and enthusiastic supporters greeted him nearly everywhere. Remember that when there's more money in circulation, it's better for those who are in debt and it's better for those who maybe are the producing masses. Um, people who support coinage of silver tend to support the workers, the farmers, people like that. While McKinley himself campaigned from his home in Canton, Ohio, the Republicans flooded the country with speakers, pamphlets, and campaign paraphernalia. They also chartered trains that brought thousands of supporters to hear McKinley speak. 
Many business leaders fear that Brian and Silver Coinage would bring financial collapse and opposed Brian's other proposals, especially the income tax and lower tariff rates. McKinley's organizers played on such fears to secure a campaign fund more than double any previous effort and many times what Brian could raise. McKinley won by the largest margin since 1872. As map 1870, or excuse me, 18.2 shows, Brian carried the South and most of the West. McKinley prevailed in the urban industrial Northeast and he carried nearly every major city. The crucial battleground was the Midwest where McKinley carried not only the urban industrial regions but also many farming areas. Brian's defeat spelled the end of the populist party. Some populists moved into Brian's Democratic Party, but others tried to maintain the tattered remains of populism. A few joined the Socialist Party, some returned to the Republicans, and a few simply ignored politics. The issues they had raised, control of huge corporations, the extension of democratic processes, a fair monetary system, lived on in politics. Their influence remained especially prominent in Brian's wing of the Democratic Party. The Grange and Alliance's cooperatives mostly failed, but the idea of producers and consumers as cooperatives continued to inspire many farmers, and later cooperatives proved more successful. Brian had appealed most to debt-ridden farmers, Western miners, and traditional Democrats in the South and big cities. McKinley forged a broader appeal by emphasizing the gold standard and protective tariff as keys to economic recovery. For many urban residents, workers, and the middle class alike, silver seemed to promise only higher prices, but the protective tariff meant manufacturing jobs. McKinley also won in part by restraining his party's nativist tendencies and by denouncing the anti-Catholic American Protective Association, the APA, thereby solidifying support among those immigrants who approved of his stand on gold and the tariff. American politics in 1888 looked much like American politics in 1876 or even 1844. But in the 1890s, American politics changed. Whether Republican or Democrat, many voters now held their party commitments less intensely than before. For most voters before 1890, ethnicity and party went hand in hand. Now, voters sometimes felt pulled toward one party by their economic situation and toward the other party by their ethnicity. Such voters sometimes supported Republicans for some offices and Democrats for others, choices now much easier to make because of the Australian ballot. Nobody's seeing what they or who they vote for now, I got the secret ballot. The political role of newspapers also changed. In the 1890s, William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer took the lead in transforming urban newspapers into mass circulation dailies, competing for readership through eye-catching headlines and sensational stories. As they focused on increasing their circulation and advertising, they also played down their ties to political parties. Some journalists began to develop the idea of providing balanced political coverage. Brian led the Democrats over much of the next 16 years, and he and his allies moved the party away from its traditional commitment to minimal government. Brian and other new Democratic leaders agreed that the solution to the problems of economic concentration lay in a more active government. A private monopoly, Brian never tired of repeating, is indefensible and intolerable. Democrats nonetheless clung to their vision of states' rights, which, which permitted Southern Democrats to perpetuate white supremacist uh, regimes. And most Northern Democrats continued to oppose nativism and such moral reforms as prohibition. As president, McKinley provided strong executive leadership and worked closely with congressional leaders of his party to develop new policies, including the gold standard and a sharply higher protective tariff. The surplus disappeared as an issue, partly because of large naval expenditures. Basically, we're spending all the money, so we can't argue about having all of it because it's gone. McKinley's victory in 1896 ushered in a new generation of Republican dominance of national politics. Republicans had majorities in the House of Representatives for 28 of the 36 years before 1894 and in the Senate for 30 of those 36 years. Republicans won seven of the nine presidential elections between 1896 and 1932, and similar patterns of Republican dominance appeared in state and local government. Standing aside from world affairs, 1865 to 1889, considering the one question, how did American policymakers define the role of the US in North America and other parts of the world during 1865 to 1889? During the years of deadlock domestic politics, little changed in the nation's slight role in world affairs. Most Americans expected their nation to follow George Washington's advice to steer clear of permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world. The effect of America's economic transformation on its foreign relations was slow in appearing. Alaska, Canada, and the Alabama claims. William H. Seward, a highly capable Secretary of State, often voiced his belief in America's destiny to expand across the North American continent. 
when he learned that Tsar Nikola Alexander II might sell Russian holdings in North America if the price was right, Seward made an offer, and in 1867, for slightly over 7 million bucks, Alaska was in U.S. hands. Some journalists derided Alaska as a frozen wasteland, and they branded it Seward's folly. Charles Sumner, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, voiced more enthusiasm looking on the purchase of Alaska as a first step toward acquiring Canada. Sumner thought a second step might lie in claims against Great Britain arising out of the Civil War. Confederate warships, notably the Alabama and Florida, built in British shipyards and given, ref uh, given refuge and repairs in British ports, had badly disrupted northern shipping. The United States claimed that Britain owed compensation for the damage done by the Confederate cruisers, and Sumner unrealistically suggested that Britain could meet this obligation by ceding all of its North American possessions, including Canada, to the United States. Ultimately, however, the two countries agreed to arbitration, and the 1872 arbitration decision set $15.5 million as damages to be paid to the United States, the U.S., and Latin America. After the Civil War, American diplomats took new interest in Latin America, partly because European powers were starting to exert influence there, and partly because some Americans wanted a more prominent role there. In 1823, President James Monroe had announced that the United States would consider any attempt by a European power to colonize in North and South America to be a threat to the U.S., but that the United States would neither interfere with existing colonies nor involve itself in European politics. Though later a linchpin of American policy, the Monroe Doctrine, as it was known at the time, was rarely mentioned by presidents until the 1890s. When it was first issued, the Monroe Doctrine didn't do a whole lot. We didn't exactly have the power to back it up, and nobody really had an interest in challenging it. Later on, though, presidents, especially Theodore Roosevelt, are going to build on the Monroe Doctrine. So just be aware of the foundation that it sets. It's not useful at the time in the 1820s, but it, it becomes much more important later on. In 1861, as the U.S. lurched into civil war, France, Spain, and Britain sent a joint force to Mexico to collect debts that Mexico could not pay. Spain and Britain withdrew, but French troops remained despite resistance led by Benito Juarez, president of Mexico. Political opponents of Juarez cooperated with the French emperor, Napoleon III, to become, to name, excuse me, Archduke Maximilian of Austria as emperor of Mexico. Maximilian, a young idealist, apparently believed that Mexican people genuinely wanted him as their leader. However, he antagonized conservative supporters with talk of reform, but he failed to win other support. In reality, Maximilian held power only because of the French troops. Involved in its own civil war, the U.S. government recognized Juarez as president, but it could do little else. When the civil war ended, Stewart demanded, or excuse me, Seward demanded that Napoleon III withdraw his troops, and 50,000 battle-hardened U.S. troops were ordered to the Mexican border. Napoleon III brought the French soldiers home. Maximilian remained behind, where he was defeated in battle by Juarez and then executed. The withdrawal of French troops in the face of American military force renewed respect in Europe for the role that the United States had in Latin America. Eastern Asia and the Pacific. Americans had longstanding commercial interests in Eastern Asia. The China trade dated to 1784 and the first treaty between China and the US in 1844 included a provision granting most favored nation status to the United States. Most favored nation status, by the way, is defined as um, when in a treaty between nation A and nation B, the provision that commercial privilege, privileges extended by A to other nations automatically become available to B. Goods from Asia and the Pacific accounted for 8% of US imports after the Civil War, but exports lagged, even though some Americans dreamed, uh, dreamed of selling manufactured goods to the millions of Chinese. Japan and Korea had refused to engage in trade, their way of deflecting Western influences and avoiding European power rivalries. In 1854, an American naval force convinced the Japanese government to open its ports to foreign trade. That was Matthew Perry. A similar Navy action opened Korea in 1882. Growing trade between Eastern Asia and the United States fueled American interests in the Pacific. American ships needed ports in the Pacific for supplies and repairs, and interests focused especially on Hawaii. Hawaii had attracted Christian missionaries from New England as early as 1819, shortly after King Kamehameha united the islands into one nation. First concerned with preaching the gospel and convincing the unabashed Hawaiians to wear clothes, some missionaries and their descendants later exercised great influence over several Hawaiian monarchs. Ideally located for resupply of ships traveling the Pacific, basically it's a good place to stop and regas. After 1848, Hawaii became a routine stop for ships sailing from New York around South America to San Francisco. As early as 1842, President John Tyler announced that the United States would not allow the islands to pass under the control of another power, but Britain and France continued to take a keen interest in them. After David Kalakaua became king of Hawaii in 1874, relations with the U.S. became much closer. 
1875, he approved a treaty that gave Hawaiian sugar free access to the United States. The Hawaiian sugar industry then expanded rapidly as descendants of missionaries joined American companies in developing huge plantations. Soon, Hawaiian sugar spawned a vertically integrated industry that included American-owned plantations, ships to carry raw sugar to the mainland, and sugar refineries in California, and the economies of the two nations became closely linked. Despite these economic ties, relations between Kalakaua and the Haole community of Hawaii were never comfortable. Haole, by the way, is the Hawaiian word for persons not of native Hawaiian ancestry, especially whites. Kalakaua wanted to preserve political power for indigenous Hawaiians, but Haole's charged him with ignoring the needs of business and the sugar plantations. In 1887, leaders of the Haole community forced a constitution on Kalakaua, reducing his power. Haole soon dem dem dominated much of the government. That same year, Kalakaua approved an extension of the Treaty of 1875 that had added exclusive rights for the U.S. Navy to use Pearl Harbor. Among some members of the royal family, resentment festered over the new constitution, the Pearl Harbor provision, and especially the extent of Haole control. These resentments boiled over after Kalakaua's death in 1891. Stepping into world affairs, Harrison in Cleveland, 1889 to 1897, considering the one question, how and why did some Americans' attitudes about the U.S. role in world affairs begin to change between 1889 and 1897? We're in the lead up to the Spanish-American War here, just to kind of situate you. During the 1890s, America's involvement outside its borders changed in important ways. New concepts of America's role in world affairs emerged in one acceptance. One element of this change involved a new role for the U.S. Navy and the commissioning of modern ships to carry it out. Building a modern Navy. Most presidents of the Gilded Age paid little attention to the Army and the Navy. After the last Indian Wars, the Army was limited to a few garrisons and many of them were near Indian reservations. Most federal decision makers understood the role of the Navy as limited to protecting America's coasts. The Navy's wooden sailing vessels deteriorated so badly that some observers ridiculed them as fit only for firewood. Congress finally authorized construction of two steam-powered cruisers in 1882, the first new ships in almost 20 years, and four more ships in 1883. Nonetheless, Secretary of the Navy William C. Whitney announced in 1885 that we have nothing which deserves to be called a Navy, and he persuaded Congress to fund the construction of several more cruisers and the first two modern battleships. Alfred Thayer Mahan played a key role in developing a modern Navy. President of the Naval War College, Mahan exerted a powerful influence through lectures to Navy officers, a book called The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, very good A-push content right there, definitely know that, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, 1890, and articles in the press. Mahan argued that sea power had determined the outcome of European power struggles for the previous 150 years, and he explored the significance of geography, population, and government for establishing such power. He advocated a large modern navy centered on huge battleships capable of carrying American power to distant seas. He also stressed the need to establish and control a canal through Central America, command the Caribbean, dominate strategic locations in the Pacific, and to create naval bases at key points. Remember that um, the Panama Canal does not exist yet. That's why people have to go all the way around South America and why people care about, you know, establishing a waterway between the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans, because one doesn't exist yet. In 1889, with Harrison in the White House and Republican majorities in both houses of Congress, Secretary of the Navy Benjamin F. Tracy urged Congress to modernize and significantly expand the Navy. Tracy's ambitious proposal might have eliminated the federal budget surplus all by itself. Congress did not give him all he wanted, but it did vote funds for modern Navy centered on battleships. With construction underway on three battleships, Tracy happily announced, we shall rule the sea as certainly as the sun doth rise. A new American mission? Mahan's strategic arguments and Tracy's battleship launchings came as some Americans began, in Mahan's phrase, to look outward. This new attitude came from many sources, Protestant ministers, scholars, business figures, historians, politicians. Together, they redefined the way many Americans, including many policymakers, viewed the nation's role in world affairs. Josiah Strong, a Protestant missionary, argued that expansion of American Protestant ideals to the world constituted a Christian duty. The world is to be Christianized and civilized, he predicted, adding that commerce follows the missionary. Frederick Jackson Turner, a historian, argued in 1893 that many American values had been formed on the frontier, but the frontier was now closed. Some interpreted this to mean that the nation needed to find new frontiers abroad. Basically, manifest destiny is not going to stop at the coast. Manifest destiny is going to go overseas and see what else it can, you know, manifest a destiny on. These ideas were also fueled by social Darwinism, the notion of progress, and a belief in the superiority of Anglo-Saxons, the English people, and their descendants. 
Popular books claimed that Anglo-Saxons had demonstrated a unique capacity for civilization and had a duty to enlighten and to uplift other peoples. Albert Beveridge, Republican Senator from Indiana, blended some of these ideas with American nationalism when he proclaimed, God has made us the master organizers of the world to establish a system where chaos reigns. Rudyard Kipling, an English poet in 1899, urged the United States to take up the white man's burden, a phrase that came to describe a self-imposed obligation to go into distant lands, bring the supposed blessings of Anglo-Saxon civilization to their peoples, Christianize them, and sell them manufactured goods. And of course, the people we're doing this to are not white. Today, historians understand Anglo-Saxonism and the white man's burden as imbued with racism. Such views assume that some people, by virtue of race, possessed a superior capability for self-government and cultural accomplishment. This thinking elevated only one cultural pattern as, quote, civilization, dismissing all others as inferior and ignoring their cultural accomplishments. Revolution in Hawaii. New views on the strategic influence of the Pacific focused, on the attention, focused the attention of many Americans on Hawaii when revolution broke out there in 1893. The revolution stemmed in part from changes in American tariff rates on sugar. In 1890, the McKinley Tariff provided that all sugar could enter the United States without paying a tariff. Previously, only Hawaiian sugar had this privilege. Now it faced new economic competition, notably from Cuban sugar. Facing economic disaster, many Hawaiian planters began to discuss annexation to the United States, basically becoming part of the US. In 1891, King Kalakaua died and was succeeded by his sister, Liliuo Kalani, who hoped to restore Hawaii to the indigenous Hawaiians and to return political power to the monarchy. Some Haole entrepreneurs feared that they might lose their political clout and economic holdings. On January 17th of 1893, they proclaimed a republic and they asked for annexation by the U.S. John L. Stevens, the U.S. Minister to Hawaii, promptly ordered the landings of 150 U.S. Marines. Liliuo Kalani surrendered, as she put it, to the superior force of the United States. Stevens immediately recognized the new republic, declared it a protectorate of the United States, and raised the American flag. The Harrison administration repudiated, meaning to reject as invalid or unauthorized, Stevens's overzealous deeds, but it opened negotiations with representatives of the New Republic anyways. The Senate received the Treaty of Annexation shortly before Cleveland became president. Cleveland was willing to consider annexing Hawaii if the Hawaiian people requested it. However, he withdrew the annexation treaty temporarily, then learned the revolution would have failed had the Marines not intervened. He asked the new officials to restore the queen, but they refused, and Hawaii continued as an independent republic dominated by its Haole business and planter community. And that's part one of how Hawaii gets stolen. Crises in Latin America. Harrison and Cleveland disagreed regarding Hawaii, but both presidents extended American involvement in Latin America. In 1991, a mob in Chile set upon several American sailors on shore leave and beat them, injuring several and killing two. When the Chilean government gave no sign of apologizing, Harrison threatened such action as may be necessary. When the Chilean government would not back down, Harrison responded with plans for a naval war. Chile then gave in, apologized, and promised to pay damages. In 1895 and 96, Cleveland also took the nation to the edge of war. At issue was the old boundary dispute between Venezuela and British Guiana. Venezuela proposed arbitration, which Cleveland also favored, but Britain refused. In July of 1895, Secretary of State Richard Olney cited the Monroe Doctrine, demanded Britain submit to arbitration, and bombastically declared the United States preeminent throughout the Western Hemisphere. When Britain still refused, Cleveland asked Congress for authority to determine the boundary and to enforce it. Now facing the possibility of conflict with the U.S. at a time when the British were concerned about the rising power of Germany and also facing possible war in South Africa, Britain finally agreed to arbitration. Both presidents behaved forcefully, but Harrison's heavy-handed threats toward Chile discouraged closer relations with Latin America. Cleveland, however, may have helped to persuade European imperial powers that the Western Hemisphere was off-limits in the ongoing scramble for colonies. Cuba presented a very different situation. Cuba and Puerto Rico were all that remained of the once mighty Spanish Empire in the Americas, and Cubans had repeatedly rebelled against Spain. In the early 1890s, when the McKinley Tariff permitted Cuban sugar to enter the U.S. without charge, the Cuban sugar industry boomed. In 1894, though, the new tariff law restored a duty on Cuban sugar and depressed the island's economy. Fueled by economic distress, a new insurrection erupted against Spanish rule. Advocates of Cuba Libre, or Free Cuba, received support from sympathizers in the U.S. In 1896, in response to the insurgents' guerrilla warfare, the Spanish commander, General Valeriano Weyler, established a reconcentration policy. Reconcentration, by the way, was the Spanish policy in Cuba in 1896 that ordered the civilian population into fortified areas so as to isolate and then annihilate the revolutionaries who remained outside. 
the civilian population was ordered into fortified towns or camps. Everybody outside of these fortified areas was considered an insurgent and subject to military action. Disease and starvation swept through the camps, though, killing many. American newspapers, especially Joseph Pulitzer's New York World and William Randolph Hearst's New York Journal, journal presented Spanish atrocities in screaming headlines, sometimes exaggerating and sensationalizing their reporters' stories, which was a practice known as yellow journalism. In response, many Americans began clamoring to rescue the Cubans. Intent on avoiding American involvement, Cleveland proclaimed U.S. neutrality and warned that Americans uh, warned Americans, excuse me, not to support the insurrection. When members of Congress pushed Cleveland to seek Cuban independence, he urged Spain to grant concessions to the insurgents. Just as he had earlier opposed annexation of Hawaii, Cleveland now resisted intervention in Cuba, fearing it might lead to annexation regardless of the will of the Cuban people. Nonetheless, by the time he left the presidency in early 1897, he suggested possible American intervention. Striding boldly in world affairs, McKinley War and Imperialism, 1898 to 1902. Here we finally are, folks. What led the U.S. to war with Spain? What new attitudes about America's role in world affairs appeared in the debate over acquiring new possessions? In 1898, the United States went to war with Spain over Cuba. John Hay, the American ambassador to Great Britain, celebrated the conflict as a splendid little war, and the description stuck. Some envisioned a quick war to save the suffering Cubans and to establish a Cuban Republic. Others saw war with Spain as an opportunity to acquire an American empire. McKinley and War. William McKinley became president amid increasing demands for action regarding Cuba. He moved cautiously, stepping up diplomatic efforts to resolve the crisis. In response, Spain softened the reconcentration policy and offered limited self-government, but not independence. In February of 1898, however, events scuttled progress toward a negotiated solution. First, Cuban insurgent insurgents stole a letter from Enrique Dupuy de Lome, the Spanish minister to the United States, and released it to the New York Journal. In it, de Lome criticized President McKinley as weak and a bitter for the admiration of the crowd. The letter also implied that the Spanish government's commitment to reform in Cuba was not serious. Although de Lome immediately resigned, the letter aroused intense anti-Spanish feeling among many Americans. A few days later, on February 15th, an explosion ripped open the USS Maine, anchored in Havana Harbor. The battleship sank, killing more than 260 Americans. The yellow press accused Spain of sabotage, but without evidence. An official inquiry blamed a submarine mine, but it could not determine its source. Years later, an investigation indicated that the blast was probably of internal origin, resulting from a fire. Regardless of how the explosion occurred, those advocating intervention now had a rallying cry, remember the Maine. Basically, now they have an excuse to want to go and invade because one of our ships blew up down there. McKinley extended his demands, an immediate end to the fighting, an end to reconcentration, measures to relieve the suffering, and mediation by McKinley. He specified that one possible outcome of mediation might be Cuban independence. In reply, the Spanish government promised reforms, agreed to end reconcentration, and consented to cease fighting if the insurgents asked for an armistice, but they said nothing about mediation or Cuban independence. On April 11th, McKinley sent a message to Congress stating that the war with Cuba must stop and asking for authority to act. Congress answered on April 19th with four resolutions. One, declaring that Cuba was and should be independent. Two, demanding that Spain withdraw at once. Three, authorizing the president to use force to accomplish Spanish withdrawal, and four, disavowing any intention to annex the island. The first three resolutions amounted to a declaration of war. The fourth is usually called the Teller Amendment for its sponsor, Senator Henry M. Teller, who was a silver Republican from Colorado. In response, Spain declared war. The Teller Amendment, again, disavowed any intention to annex the island, basically saying, we will not annex Cuba. We're not going to make Cuba part of the U.S., Cuba's been a big deal for all. Remember the Austin Manifesto from a few chapters ago? Most Americans wholeheartedly approved what they understood to be a war undertaken to bring independence and aid to the long-suffering Cubans. Some, however, distrusted the McKinley administration's motives. The Teller Amendment reflected this concern that the McKinley administration might try to make Cuba an American possession rather than granting its independence. The Splendid Little War. Americans' attention had been riveted on Cuba. Many were surprised that the first engagement in the war occurred in the Philippine Islands, nearly halfway around the world from Cuba. Why are we over there? The Philippines had been a Spanish colony for 300 years, but had rebelled repeatedly, most recently in 1896. Some Americans understood the island's strategic location with regard to Eastern Asia, including Assistant Secretary of the Navy Theodore Roosevelt. 
In February of 1896, six weeks before McKinley's war message to Congress, Roosevelt drew upon planning exercises by the Naval War College when he cabled George Dewey, the American Naval commander in the Pacific, to crush the Spanish fleet at Manila Bay if war broke out. At sunrise on Sunday, May 1st, Dewey's squadron streamed into Manila Bay and quickly destroyed or captured a larger Spanish fleet. The Spanish lost 161 men and 210 were wounded. The Americans lost one, a victim of heat prostration, and nine were wounded. Dewey instantly became a national hero for his capture of so much of the Spanish fleet. Dewey's victory at Manila focused pu public attention on the Western Pacific, raising the prospect of a permanent American presence there. This possibility, in turn, revived interest in the Hawaiian Islands as a base halfway to the Philippines. Anti-imperialist sentiment in the Senate made approval of an annexation treaty unlikely, so McKinley revived the joint resolution precedent by which Texas had been annexed in 1844. Only a majority vote in both houses of Congress was required to adopt a joint resolution, rather than the two-thirds vote of the Senate needed to approve a treaty. Annexation of Hawaii was finally accomplished on July 7th. Dewey's victory clearly demonstrated American naval superiority. However, the Spanish army in Cuba outnumbered the entire American army by five to one and had years of experience on the island. When McKinley called for volunteers, nearly a, mil a million men responded, five times as many as the army needed. Next, the army began to train and supply the new recruits. Sent to training camps in the South, the new soldiers found chaos and confusion. Food, uniforms, and equipment arrived at one location, while the intended recipients stood hungry and idle at a different location. Disease raged through some camps, killing many men. Others died from tainted food, called embalmed beef by the troops. Some African-American soldiers refused to comply with racial segregation, and many white Southerners objected to the presence in their communities of uniformed and armed Black men. Congress declared war in late April, but not until June did the first troop transports head for Cuba. When they finally arrived in Cuba, American forces tried to capture the port city of Santiago, where the Spanish fleet had taken refuge. Inexperienced, poorly equipped, and unfamiliar with the terrain, the Americans landed some distance away from Santiago, Santiago excuse me, and assaulted the fortified hills surrounding the city. Theodore Roosevelt had resigned as Assistant Secretary of the Navy to organize a cavalry unit known as the Rough Riders. At Kettle Hill, near Santiago, he led a successful charge of Rough Riders and regular army units, including parts of the 9th and 10th Cavalry made up of African Americans. All but Roosevelt were on foot because their horses had not yet arrived. Driving the Spanish from the crest of Kettle Hill cleared a serious impediment to the assault on nearby San Juan Heights and San Juan Hill. Journalists loved Roosevelt and newspapers all over the country declared him the hero of the Battle of San Juan Hill. Once American troops gained control of the high ground around Santiago Harbor, the Spanish fleet tried to escape. A larger American fleet met them though and duplicated Dewey's route in Manila. Every Spanish ship was sunk or was run aground. The Spanish suffered 323 deaths and the Americans only one death. Their fleet destroyed, surrounded by American troops. The Spanish in Santiago surrendered on July 17th. A week later, American forces also occupied Puerto Rico. Spanish land forces in the Philippines surrendered when the first American troops arrived in mid-August. The splendid little war lasted only 16 weeks. More than 306,000 men served in the American forces. Only 385 of them died in battle, but more than 5,000 died of disease and other causes. Disease was definitely a much bigger killer than actually going into battle in the Spanish-American War, as is true in so many other conflicts. The Treaty of Paris, because what else would it be called? On August 12th, the United States and Spain agreed to stop fighting and hold a peace conference in Paris. The major question centered on the Philippines. Finley Peter Dunn, a popular humorist, parodied the national debate in a discussion between his fictional characters, Mr. Dooley, a Chicago saloon keeper, and a customer named Hennessy. Hennessy insists that McKinley should take the islands. Dooley retorts that it's not more than two months since you learned whether they were islands or canned goods. Then he confesses his own decision. I can't annex them because I don't know where they are. I can't let go of them because someone else will take them. It would break my heart to think of giving people I've never seen or heard tell of back to other people I don't know. I don't know what to do about the Philippines, and I'm all alone in the world. Everybody else has made up his mind. McKinley voiced almost as many doubts as Mr. Dewey. At first, he seemed to favor only a naval base, leaving Spain in control elsewhere. However, by mid-August, Filipinos seeking independence had taken charge everywhere but in Manila. Britain, Japan, and Germany watched carefully, and one or another seemed likely to step in if the United States withdrew. McKinley and his advisors decided that a naval base on Manila Bay would require control of the entire island group. No one seriously considered the Filipinos' desire for independence. McKinley understood the political and strategic importance of the Philippines for Eastern Asia. He invoked other nations, or excuse me, other reasons, however, when he explained his decision to a group of visiting Methodists. 
He repeatedly prayed for guidance on the Philippine question, he told them. Late one night, he said it came to him that there was nothing left for us to do but to take them all and to educate the Filipinos and uplift and civilize and Christianize them and by God's grace, do the very best we could by them. In fact, most Filipinos had been Catholics for centuries, but no one ever expressed more clearly the concept of the white man's burden. Spain resisted giving up the Philippines, but McKinley insisted. The Treaty of Paris, signed in December of 1898, required Spain to surrender Cuba, cede Puerto Rico and Guam to the United States, and to sell the Philippines for $20 million. For the first time in American history, a treaty acquiring new territory failed to confer U.S. citizenship on the residents. Basically, we get all of this land, but they are not going to be U.S. citizens. Nor did the treaty mention future statehood. Thus, these acquisitions represented a new kind of expansion. America had become a colonial power. The Treaty of Paris dismayed Democrats, populists, and some conservative Republicans, sparking a debate over acquisition of the Philippines in particular and imperialism in general. An anti-imperialist movement quickly formed with William Jennings Bryan, Andrew Carnegie, Grover Cleveland, Carl Schurz, and Mark Twain among its outspoken proponents. They argued that the treaty denied self-government for the newly acquired territories and that holding colonies threatened the very concept of democracy. Basically, how can we be a democracy when we're a colonial power over somebody else? The Declaration of Independence warned Carnegie will make every Filipino a thoroughly dissatisfied subject. Others voiced racist arguments, claiming the Filipinos were incapable of self-government and that the U.S. would be corrupted by ruling such people. Labor leaders fear fearing Filipino migration repeated arguments once used to secure Chinese exclusion. Those who defended acquisition of the Philippines echoed McKinley's lofty pronouncements about America's duty. Albert Beveridge, senator from Indiana, among others, also cited economic benefits. We are raising more than we can consume, making more than we can use. Therefore, we must find new markets for our produce. New markets were not limited to the new possessions. A strong naval and military presence in the Philippines would make the U.S. a leading power in Eastern Asia, thereby supporting access for American business to markets in China. William Jennings Bryan urged senators to approve the treaty. That way, he reasoned that the U.S. alone could determine the future of the Philippines. Once the treaty was approved, he argued the U.S. should immediately grant them independence. By a narrow margin, the Senate approved the treaty on February 6th of 1899. Soon after, senators rejected a proposal for Philippine independence. The New American Empire. Bryan hoped to make independence for the Philippines the central issue in the 1900 presidential election. He easily won the Democratic nomination for a second time, and the Democrats' platform condemned the McKinley administration for its imperialism. Bryan found, however, that many conservative anti-imperialists would not support his candidacy because he still insisted on silver coinage, and he attacked big business. The Republicans renominated McKinley. For vice president, they chose Theodore Roosevelt, hero of San Juan Hill. McKinley's re-election seemed unstoppable. Republican campaigners pointed proudly to the highly, su highly su successful war, legislation on the tariff and gold standard, and the return of prosperity. Bryan repeatedly attacked imperialism. McKinley and Roosevelt never used the term at all, and they instead took pride in expansion. McKinley easily won a second term with 52% of the vote. Now the McKinley administration set about organizing its new empire. The Teller Amendment specified that the U.S. would not annex Cuba, but the McKinley administration refused to recognize the insurgents as a legitimate government. Instead, the U.S. Army took control. After two years of Army rule, the McKinley administration permitted Cuban voters to hold a constitutional convention. The convention met in 1900 and drafted a constitution model than that of the United States. Nowhere did it define relations between Cuba and the U.S. In response, the McKinley administration drafted and Congress stopped in terms for Cuba to adopt before the Army could withdraw. Called the Platt Amendment, the terms specified that one, Cuba was not to make any agreement with a foreign power that impaired the island's independence. Two, the U.S. could intervene in Cuba to preserve Cuban independence and to maintain law and order. And three, Cuba was to lease facilities to the U.S. for naval bases and for coaling stations. Cubans reluctantly agreed, changed their constitution, and signed a treaty with the U.S. stating the Platt conditions. In 1902, Cuba thereby became a protectorate of the United States. The Teller Amendment did not apply to Puerto Rico. There, the Army provided a military government until 1900 when Congress approved the Foraker Act. That act made Puerto Ricans citizens of Puerto Rico, not American citizens. Puerto Rican voters could elect a legislature, but final authority rested with a governor and council appointed by the President of the United States. In 1901, in the Insular Cases, the Supreme Court confirmed the colonial status of Puerto Rico and, by implication, the other new possessions. The court ruled that they were not equivalent to earlier ter territorial acquisitions and that their people did not possess the constitutional rights of citizens. Very important, definitely know the insular, ca insular cases right there. Establishment of civil government in the Philippines took longer. 
Between Dewey's victory and arrival of the first American soldiers three months later, a Philippine independence movement led by Emilio Aguinaldo, very big name there, Emilio Aguinaldo established a provisional government and took control everywhere but Manila. Aguinaldo and his government wanted independence. When the United States determined to keep the islands, the Filipinos resisted. Quelling what American authorities called the Philippine insurrection required three years, 1899 to 1902, and it took the lives of 4,196 American soldiers and maybe 700,000 or more Filipinos, mostly through disease and other non-combat causes. And it cost $400 million, which was 20 times what we had paid for the islands. When some Filipinos resorted to guerrilla warfare, US troops adopted practices similar to those Spain had used in Cuba. Both sides committed atrocities and anti-imperialists pointed to brutal behavior by American troops as proof that a colonial policy was corrupting American values. American troops captured Aguinaldo in 1901, but resistance continued into mid-1902. Congress set up a government for the Philippines similar to that of Puerto Rico. Filipinos became citizens of the Philippine Islands, but not of the United States. The president of the US appointed the governor. Filipino voters elected one house in the two house legislature and the governor appointed the other. Both the governor and the US Congress could veto laws passed by the legislature. William Howard Taft, governor from 1901 to 1904, tried to build local support for American control, secured limited land reforms, and he started to build public schools, hospitals, and sanitary facilities. However, when the first Philippine legislature met in 1907, more than half of its members favored independence. The Open Door and the Boxer Rebellion in China. Late in 1899, Britain, Germany, and the United States signed the Treaty of Berlin, which divided Samoa between Germany and the United States. The new Pacific acquisitions of the US, Hawaii, the Philippines, Guam, and Samoa contained excellent sites for naval bases. Combined with the modernized Navy, these acquisitions greatly strengthened American ability to assert power in the region and to protect Americans' commercial interests, excuse me, access to Eastern Asia. The United States now began to participate in the East Asian balance of power. Weakened by war with Japan in 1894 to 1895, the Chinese government could not resist European nations' demands for territory. Britain, Germany, Russia, and France had carved out spheres of influence, or areas where they claimed special rights, usually a monopoly over trade, and sought to exclude other powers. The U.S. argued instead for the open door, the principle that citizens of all nations should have equal status in seeking trade. American observers, however, began to fear the breakup of China into separate European colonies and the exclusion of American commerce. In 1899, Secretary of State John Hay circulated a letter to Germany, Russia, Britain, France, Italy, and Japan, asking them to preserve Chinese sovereignty within their spheres of influence and not to discriminate against citizens of other nations engaged in commerce within their spheres. Hay wanted both to prevent the dismemberment of China and to maintain commercial access for American business throughout China. Some replies proved less than fully supportive, but Hay announced in a second letter that all had agreed to his, quote, open door principle. Hayes's letters have usually been called the open door notes. Definitely know the open door notes. In 1900, a Chinese secret society tried to expel foreigners from China. Because the rebels used a clenched fist as their symbol, Westerners called them boxers. The boxers laid siege to the section of Beijing, the Chinese capital, that housed foreign legations. He feared that other powers might use the rebellion as a pretext to take control and divide China permanently. To block such a move, the U.S. took full part in an international military expedition to rescue the besieged foreign diplomats and to crush the so-called boxer rebellion. Although China did not lose territory, the intervening nations required it to pay an indemnity. After compensating U.S. citizens for their losses, the U.S. government returned the remainder of its indemnity to China. The Chinese government, in return, used the money to send Chinese students to study in the United States. A deeper understanding of history, the decision to annex the Philippine Islands. Historians frequently analyze the way the people in past times have made decisions. In doing so, historians often think in terms of expectations, what the people wanted to accomplish, the choices they faced, the constraints they perceived on their actions, what limited their choices, and the various outcomes of the choices they made. At the end of the war with Spain, as a result of Dewey's victory over the Spanish fleet in Manila Bay, President McKinley and his advisors had to choose among several alternatives regarding the Philippine Islands. Hanging over their decision was the expectation among many members of the, of the administration that the U.S. should take a larger role in East Asian balance of power so as to prevent other nations from restricting future American commerce in the region, especially in China. Each choice, however, carried a constraint. Choice, the U.S. should leave the Philippines alone. Constraint, Spanish authority had collapsed everywhere in the Philippines except in Manila. A U.S. departure might well mean that an expansive, expansive power in East Asia, most likely Japan or Germany, might take control in the Philippines. This choice was seen as losing the opportunity to bolster the U.S. position in East Asia.
choice. The U.S. could take only a site for naval base and leave the rest of the Philippines to Spain or, alternatively, let the rest of the islands establish a republic. Constraint. Spanish authority had collapsed everywhere except Manila, and the ability of a Philippine republic to defend itself was unclear. This choice, too, might mean that Japan, Germany, or another power would take control in the Philippines, leaving a U.S. base vulnerable to attack. Choice. The U.S. could take all of the Philippines and maintain a significant naval and military presence there, thereby establishing itself as a major player in the East Asian balance of power. Constraint. The Filipinos might resist American authority and seek to maintain their independent republic. The McKinley administration chose the third alternative and insisted on taking all of the Philippines as the surest way to provide security for a major U.S. naval base and also as the way most likely to make the United States a major player in the East Asian balance of power. Little or no consideration was given to the first alternative, nor to a version of the second alternative in which the United States would protect the independence of the Philippine Republic. This choice led to the following short-term outcomes. First, a war with those Filipinos who wanted independence. Second, a major U.S. naval and military presence in East Asia. Third, the open door notes. And fourth, U.S. participation in suppressing the Boxer Rebellion. In an unanticipated outcome, significant numbers of Filipinos migrated to work in Hawaii and the Western United States, where some of them took leading roles in organizing unions of farm workers and cannery workers in the 1930s and after. Over the long run, after regaining control of the islands following World War II, the U.S. granted independence to the Philippines but negotiated a lease on military bases and a mutual defense treaty. Because of growing opposition to the presence of U.S. military personnel in the Philippines, the last base was closed in 1992. I want to point out that we have the Philippines. We don't give them independence until after World War II when there's all these decolonization movements happening all over the world. We have them for a long time. Sometimes that surprises students. Individual Voices, Carl Schurz, Comments on America's Changing Role in World Affairs, 1896 to 1899. Schurz maintained a strong interest in world affairs throughout his political career, serving on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and later helping organize the Anti-Imperialist League. The following three selections addressing major changes in America's role in world affairs during the 1890s brought Schurz acclaim from other mugwump types and from many Democrats. Such primary sources assist historians in understanding opposition to the McKinley administration's policies. From a speech on January 2nd of 1896. What is the rule of honor to be, to be observed by a power so strongly and so advantageously situated as this republic is? It should not, as our boyish jingos wish it to be, swagger about among the nations of the world with a chip on its shoulder, shaking its fist in everybody's face. It should not, whenever its own, nation, own notions of right or interest collide with the notions of others, fall into hysterics and act as if it really feared for its own security and its very independence. With all its latent resources for war, it should be the great peace power of the world. Is not this peace with honor? There has of late been much loose speech about Americanism. Is not this good Americanism? It is surely today the Americanism of those who love their country the most. From Harper's Weekly, April 16th, 1898. The man who in times of popular excitement boldly and unflinchingly resists hot-tempered clamor for an unnecessary war and thus exposes himself to the opprobrious imputation of a lack of patriotism or of courage to the end of saving his country from a great calamity is, as to loving and faithfully serving his country, at least as good a patriot as the hero of the most daring feat of arms, and a far better one than those who, with an ostentatious present pretense of superior patriotism, cry for war before it is needed, especially if they then let others do the fighting. From a speech, October 17, 1899. I confidently trust that the American people will prove themselves too wise not to detect the false pride or the dangerous ambitions or the selfish schemes which so often hide themselves under that deceptive cry of mock patriotism, our country right or wrong. They will not fail to recognize that our dignity, our free institutions, and the peace and welfare of this and coming generations of Americans will be secure only as we cling to the watchword of true patriotism, our country, when right to be kept right, when wrong to be put right. Summary. In the late 19th century, political parties dominated politics. All elected public officials were nominated by party conventions and elected through party campaigns. Nearly all government jobs came through the spoils system. Republicans used government to promote rapid economic development, but Democrats argued for minimal government. Voters divided between the major parties largely along lines of region, ethnicity, and race. The presidency of Ulysses S. Grant was plagued by scandals. Thereafter, the closely balanced strengths of the two parties contributed to a long-term political stalemate. In 1889 to 90, however, Republicans wrote most of their campaign promises into law. Grangers, Greenbackers, and Silverites challenged the major parties, appealing mostly to debt-ridden farmers. Mugwumps argued for the merit system in the civil service, which was accomplished through the Pendleton Act of 1883, signed into law by, of course, President Chester A. Arthur. By the late 19th century, a well-organized woman suffrage movement had emerged. 
a wide range of reform groups sought both structural changes and policy changes. The 1890s saw major long-lasting changes in American politics. A political upheaval began when Western and Southern farmers joined the Farmers' Alliances, then launched a new political party, the Populist Party. Elected in 1892, President Grover Cleveland failed to meet the political challenges of the Depression that began in 1893. His party, the Democrats, lost badly in 1894 congressional elections. In 1896, the Democrats nominated for President William Jennings Bryan, who, uh, and the a supporter of silver coinage. The Republicans chose William McKinley, who favored the protective tariff. McKinley won, beginning a period of Republican dominance in national politics that lasted until 1930. Under Bryan's leadership, the Democratic Party promoted government action against monopolies and other powerful economic interests. From 1865 to 1889, few Americans expected their nation to be significantly involved in world affairs outside of North America. The U.S. did acquire Alaska, pressure the French to withdraw from Mexico, and they took actions to encourage trade with Eastern Asia. The Kingdom of Hawaii became closely integrated with the American economy. During the early 1890s, the United States moved toward a new role in world affairs. President Harrison and Cleveland asserted American power in Latin America. A revolution in Cuba led the U.S. into a one-sided war with Spain in 1898, resulting in acquisition of the Philippines, Guam, and Puerto Rico. Congress annexed Hawaii in the midst of the war, and the U.S. acquired part of Samoa in 1899. Filipinos resisted American authority, leading to a three-year war. With the Philippines and an improved Navy, the U.S. gained new prominence in Eastern Asia, especially in China, where the U.S. promoted the open-door policy and where American troops also helped to suppress the Boxer Rebellion.